block which Dr. Karmakar is going to perform live from Fortis Hospital, Gurga. Rani, we can't hear you. Hello. Uh, now, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, Rani. Dr. P. N. Kakar so, uh, will moderate, will interact with you on behalf of uh, the audience here. Uh, right. Well. Right. So, we are ready for a demonstration of blocks. So, the first uh, block to take off with is um, the spinal block, the ultrasound guided subarachnoid block. So I will, um, Dr. Karmakar is just about getting ready for it. So I'm going to hand over to the mic to him and he will talk to you as he scans. Can you hear us? Yes, very loud and clear. Can you hear us? Okay, me? that's lovely. Now, that's lovely. you... Now, from the, from the audience perspective, you, everybody audience does spinal anesthesia every other day. Anesthesia uh, every what day. extra are you doing? Uh, they will like to know because you are going to do an ultrasound guided thing. So, I will be happy if you go on giving your comments simultaneously. Yeah, sure, I will. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is... Uh, a 75-year-old lady, she's going to have a TURBT done. So the plan is to do a spinal, and this will be followed by an obturator nerve block. Uh, now, I positioned her in the left lateral position because I'm right-handed. Because I'm right-handed, this allows me to use my left hand to perform the scan, and I can use my right hand to do the intervention. So if you're left-handed, then you must pay a little attention to the ergonomics because you may have to position the patient the other way and uh, you know I would if I were left-handed I would probably be on the other side okay the first thing is uh, I have as you can see here I put the ilia crest I have palpated the spinous processes and as I mentioned yesterday the SP line is straight here so at the very outset with my landmarks, I don't expect this spine to be of any abnormality. It's a straight spine, a straight SP line, so she doesn't have scoliosis, hopefully. The next is this is, I marked the intercrystal line, but I will be using the ultrasound primarily to later on to, to in my routine to determine what level I would like to do the block. The first thing is, uh, as I said yesterday, I'm going to show you some of the basic, uh, uh, basic windows. As you can see here now in the ultrasound image, I can see the spinous process. Okay, so this is the midline. This is a mid, mid uh, it's a transverse process view. It is a, a over the spinous process. So you can see the spinous process, the hyperechogenic structure, and you can see the lamina on either side. So if I now translate the transverse slightly caudad, you can see the. Uh, just a moment. Uh, Dr. Manoj, though the image is very clear, uh, will you like to tell the audience something about the probe, which is the probe you are using? Yeah, it's a deep structure, as I said yesterday, so we are using a curved array probe. Uh, this is a C5 to 1, it's a 5 megahertz to 1 megahertz. Uh, and I think you, I, I prefer to use a probe like so because uh, it is, as you can see here, it's quite slim. Uh, it is ergonomically much better to use a probe that is light and, and slimmer than to use a probe that's very uh, bulky and huge. So I think uh, some of the providers in, in, in uh, ultrasound companies are, are working towards developing more ergonomic probes, smaller curve probes. But I think uh, for now this is uh, uh, what I'm going to use. So the orientation marker is pointed to the right side. So the, the P on the top of your left of your screen is the right side. Okay, so. I'm going to now uh, show you a transverse view over the, mi over the mid midline. And you can see this is a spinous process with the acoustic shadow. And uh, if you look more uh, distally, you can see the lamina shadow on the other side. Now, one has to appreciate that because she's elderly, the, the uh, ultrasound images are a little bit of variable quality compared to a young volunteer. So uh, folks must appreciate that when you go to workshops, you see healthy, young, fit, 
young volunteers, athletes most of the time. But when you're really working in the, in the hospitals, situation is slightly different. Now, uh, can you point to the lamina there? The lamina, that's the structure just below that. The hyper, yeah, that's the lamina on top here. Yeah. So that's your lamina there. So you can see that the, the two lamina are, are quite symmetrical and they are on either side. Now this is the midline. So if, if I were to, if I were to uh, perform a block and you are really looking for the midline, then you can use your marker and, and place your, say, a mark here. So this is right over the midline. Now this, say, if you are doing an obese individual or somebody with a lot of edema and you can't palpate it, <coughs> as long as you can see the spinous process, you centralize it, and then you can put a mark towards the center of the probe. This, again, I think is very important because if you look at the probe, there isn't a point which says this is the center of the probe. So if there are any industry people out here, I think we as anesthesiologists would like you to put a mark on the center of the probe. I say this everywhere, so hopefully one day they will listen to us. Okay, once we've done that, uh, I will show you the interspinous view, okay? That means I just need to move the probe slightly caudad, and you can see the interspinous view now. Now, in this interspinous view, we, we don't see the true shadow of the <coughs> spinous process, but you can see the articular <coughs> process on either side. These two bony structures are the articular processes. And uh, in between that, you have the, uh, the spinal canal. The spinal canal, yes, that's it. Now, again, as you can see here in this individual, the images are not like what I showed you yesterday because those are from young, healthy volunteers. But at least you can see how deep the dura would be. The arrow is probably where the dura is located here, the posterior dura. But again, as I said, the anterior complex is further anterior. So that's the width of the spinal canal. And uh, we can actually freeze the image. If you freeze the image there, yeah, right. If, if you freeze the image, you can use the caliper of the system to determine what the depth of this space uh, of the dura would be from like so. So if you see on the left of your screen in the left bottom, you can see there is, no, 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 no you can't do that now. Yeah. Uh, you can see that they say the distance of about four, four centimeters to the posterior dura. Now, this correlates very well with uh, eventual distances, but must remember that there is some compression when you apply the transducer. Okay. Uh, so I, I see here that I found the midline. I, I can, I've done my malampati, and I said that this is, I wouldn't say malampati, but I have assessed that there is no <laughs> rotation in the vertebra. Now I'm going to determine uh, the level that we would like to do the spinal. So as I said, you have to have a routine. The first thing I will do is I will scan over the sacrum. You see there? This is uh, the sacrum here. This is a large, flat surface of the sacrum. And as you scan carefully, lad, no, it's okay. Uh, the arrow will be here. If you take the arrow. Okay. This is a large, flat surface of the sacrum. You can see there. Uh, and as you translate the transducer, this is the, actually the S1 intervertebral foramina. But as I go up, you will see this is the L5-S1 gap. Okay. So this is the uh, sacrum, and then this is the lamina of L5. So you can see that it looks like a horse head. Uh, and also notice that my <coughs> probe is sagittal, but it's a ob sagittal oblique scan. If I just do a true sagittal, you can see we are actually seeing the articular processes. So it's not possible in some individuals to actually get a laminar view if you just do a true sagittal next to the spine because of the width of the, the thickness, because of the thickness of the, uh, of the transducer, it, it, it it doesn't get there. So in order to see it, and you can see here, if I, if I tilt the probe, you can see that the dura is very clearly visible there. And you can see the lamina, the interlamellar space. Uh, and that is the epidural space, the space, just the black area behind the dura. It's a few millimeters wide. So in principle, if you wanted to do a, a spinal, then you can insert the needle from here. And as long as you can guide it through that interlamellar space, you'll enter the spinal canal. Now, uh, also uh, a tip for you is, if you can see the anterior complex. Now in this lady, uh, despite her age, the interlamellar spaces are quite wide, which is uh, good for us today. But in some situations, you may find that <coughs> the interlamellar spaces are narrow, and we can understand why, because in, 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 as age increases, this uh, becomes a problem. But you can see the anterior complex, actually now the, the the arrowhead is on the cordae equina. You can see it is pulsatile. You can see sometimes you can see pulsations there. Uh, and 
If you can see the anterior complex, it is telling me that there is a hole there, as I said yesterday. So my, my focus would be to try and guide the needle to that. Now, because this is the sacrum, this is your L5, S1. So I can count L5, L4, and L3. So once I've found L3, 4, 5 level, I put two marks on the back. Which marker will get? Thank you. Is it washable? Yeah, good. So uh, what I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to put two marks on the back relative to this transducer. So, so anything I see between uh, the confines of these two lines is L345. So you can now see the lamina of L345. Now you can now choose which space to do the block or do the spinal intervention. As you can see here, L45 to me looks the best place to do it. Okay. So you can choose which, which, which space you're going to do it. So I'm going to do it through L4-5. Now, this, this is a, I will try and show you a real-time intervention, but it is not really necessary to do real-time intervention. If you do a pre-procedural scan, and you've got all this information in it, and then you can do a paramedian, you know uh, your, it, there is evidence that it improves the success rate and so. So I think real-time is... It's very fashionable, but I don't think sometimes it's very practical because there are a lot of uh, practicalities that go into it. Also, um, uh, in continuum with this, once you see the lamina, I'd like to show you the articular processes. So I'm going to scan a little bit lateral, okay? And you can see here, these are the, the humps that you see there, and the facet joints in between the two humps there, you can see. So these are the articular processes. So if you're doing a spinal imaging and you see the articular processes, you means, it means that your transducer is too lateral. You need to go more medial. Okay? The next is, uh, if I go lateral to the, to the, to the articular processes, now you're seeing the, the, the shadows of the, uh, of the transverse processes and the typical trishul sign or the trident sign that I showed you yesterday. I think Dr. Diwan will talk more about this later. But in this case, we are seeing L345 here, L, the articular processes and the lamina. So the goal here is to, uh, to do a paramedian. It's a, it's a sagittal. It's an oblique scan uh, at the L345 level. We've identified it. And we will try and perform the spinal intervention through here. Now, there are a few practical things when you uh, do uh, neuraxial blocks with, uh, with ultrasound. While gel is quite OK when you perform the intervention, uh, do the pre-procedural scan. Um, Gel is a no-no when you do ultrasound-guided blocks because there is evidence today, it's certainly from animal studies, that the gel can induce chemical arachnoiditis, meningitis, inflammatory response uh, in, the, in, in the neuraxis. So uh, when you do neuraxial blocks, uh, you have to make sure that there is no gel in the area that your needle goes through, unlike when you do peripheral nerve blocks. So that means that the quality of the images will, will degrade a bit. But you can use some compensation in the, in the ultrasound systems to, to overcome that. Uh, and uh, you also have to make this, uh, uh, prepare the probe in a sterile fashion uh, and uh, do the intervention. So I'm going to just uh, prepare myself and then we'll do the intervention, okay? Uh, can you, let's go to us, post then I think, yeah? It's Kobe, yeah, I think, if somebody has <laughs> Actually, what uh, I would like is, can you give me one Noel, any questions from the audience? Yeah, you keep this any questions to him from the audience? I have to go scrub up somewhere there. Uh, deep, deep. Can you hear me now? Uh, 
deep. Dr. Kakkar, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear very clearly. Yeah, are there any questions for Dr. Karmakar? Yes, somebody was uh, wanting him to demonstrate uh, how he will do it in sitting position. So I think that we'll do later because he said he's doing uh, in lateral no, position. No, I think uh, when I heard him talk yesterday, he said his preference was lateral position. Yes, yes. So the patient is already positioned in the lateral uh, uh, position and he's reacting and draping the patient. And as soon as we are ready for the block, uh, we'll focus on the procedure. In the meanwhile, if there are any questions, I could direct it towards uh, Manoj Karma. Uh, hello. Uh, there is a question from the audience. They are asking, uh, yeah. is it always possible to see the epidural space or no? I did not understand. What was that? I'll... When, when they well, I, uh, the question I heard right was, is the epidural space always possible to see? Is that Yes, question? during ultrasound scanning. Uh, well, uh, in certain individuals, yes, but in certain individuals it may not be. So sometimes the posterior, it is called as a posterior complex when the ligamentum flavum and the uh, posterior dura are placed to, together. Okay. So when uh, they are... When they cannot be differentiated, it is called as the posterior complex. Okay, thank you. Is it always that the uh, ultrasound guided spinal uh, block is given in the paramedian position? Is it preferable to the midline? Is it preferable to the midline position? Midline approach? As, uh, By midline approach, with ultrasound what you will see is obviously the spine. Hmm. And with the paramedian approach, you are going to see things right till the dura, and that is what you would be more so, interested in. So it, it means what that uh, hence the, para the paramedian approach is uh, yes. Hence, the paramedian approach is the way to go. It, it's it's much better than the midline for ultrasound. Uh, yes, because okay. para by paramedian approach, you are going to visualize the dura or the posterior complex. Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, do, does flexion uh, make a difference in the lateral position if the patient's back is flexed or uh, it's not flexed? Does it make a difference in the visualization in ultrasound? That's a great question to ask, sir. Yes, the flexion does make a difference in the way that suppose if I am a pediatric anesthesiologist and I want to give a caudal block, the entire sac is pulled up a bit and that gives me a bit of safety margin to perform a caudal block in a flexed position. And logically, of course, when you flex the spine, the interlaminar space and the interspinous space are going to open up. So obviously you're going to get a better window. Yeah, but if you're How are you all finding the live work? Well, it's uh, pretty clear, very good, and we're enjoying talking to you. That's great. Uh, Rushali, uh, continuing the. So, Dr. Om and Dr. Deep have really worked extremely hard with their entire team to make this happen. Well, now I can see that the patient is, pa is getting prepared for a real-time intervention and Dr. Manoj is all set up here wearing his gloves. <coughs> well, how was yesterday? Somebody said fantastic, somebody said very nice. You want to hear some better words? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a great evening. We all enjoyed it. Great. And throughout the day, we enjoyed the program. That's such a pleasure to hear, sir. Yes. So we give over to Dr. Karmakar now. We really enjoyed it. Okay, uh, <laughs> so uh, again, uh, I, it's important to understand that 
we have the patient in the lateral position. Uh, somebody asked, should you flex? Yes, I think you should flex the patient as far as the patient can, can do it because flexion does make a difference to the uh, interlamellar space and if the interlamellar space determines the acoustic window. It's like uh, you open a door and that's the door through which the ultrasound energy enters the spinal canal. So if you have a narrow door, less energy will enter, so the images are going to be correspondingly uh, poorer. Now, I have two gloves. I'm going to prepare the transducer with uh, sterile preparations, but uh, so it's, it's quite common sometimes to contaminate your, your gloves. So after I prepare the probes, I will remove the outer glove and do the intervention. Uh, could you bring the, tr the trolley to the right-hand side, please? What happened to the... No, no. Could you bring the... So because I'm a right-handed, for ergonomics, I'll have my trolley to, the, to, to my right. And then uh, it's coming. OK, let's go ahead. No problem. You've already prepped the back, have you? Prepped the back already? Yes, sir. OK. So uh, would you like to prepare the transducer for me? Oh, I don't need that. OK, uh, what we are going to do now is, uh, can I have one more? Take it down. Uh, if you, Rani, can you hold it up? Yeah. So uh, I'd like you to see, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'm going to do, oh, just a moment. So we're going to apply a, a tachyderm onto the footprint here. As you can see here, it's going to, you should stretch it so that there is no air trapped on the footprint, okay? And then I'm going to remove these uh, paper sleeves. Oops. There are different kind of tachyderms everywhere. Yeah. Okay, the next one, if you give it to me again. I'm going to put it on the, oh. Actually, the tachyderms we use are quite stretchable. It's a little different here. Okay, be a little bit more gentle this time. No, no, just keep it upright, yeah. Dr. Marker, okay. this has got something to do with you here. <laughs> it is to do with my strength. Okay, uh, I think, yeah, let's try. I think you do it because I'm going to ruin that again. Just put it on the on the neck of the transducer again. Yeah. Around it, yeah. You need a little stretch, but that's fine. Okay, that's good. Is that a female touch or a male touch? That's a male touch, sir. That's a male touch, all right. Okay, now, once uh, we've done that, yeah, that's fine, don't, don't worry about it, okay. Now, uh, I take this uh, sleeve in my hand, I'm going to put it into this, and then Ronnie can pull it away, yeah, okay? And then we are more or less ready for it. Yeah. So, do you have a rubber band or something I can use here? No. Yeah, there's a rubber band here. So, there's a rubber band here, so you can do that. Okay, I'm going to put it to lose the across here. Now I'm going to remove this uh, outer gloves so that, as I told you, it is something that one must pay a little bit of attention. Now the next thing is, I need a little pot, sorry, uh, to for saline because we can't use we can't use gel. Uh, we use saline as a coupling agent, so saline is going to be here. So there will be no ultrasound gel for this, this procedure, certainly for the obturator nerve later on, but for this, we're just going to use... Yes, Sandeep, could you give me that uh, introducer, please? Yeah, just drop it here. Now, the size of the needle actually is important because uh, if you use very fine needles, it's very difficult to see the, the needle in... Uh, even if you're doing in-plane interventions, especially with a low-frequency probe in this situation. So uh, I'm going to try at, what do you normally use in your practice here? 
Spinal? What would you use in this? Okay, that's fine. Have you got it? Can Which is the size you are going to use? Yeah. Uh, and what size of needle would you normally use here? 25 gauge. Okay. So 25 gauge, please. So I'm going to try a 25 gauge. Okay. Now, as I said, it, it may not be very easily visualized, but so I, I, I cooked something up uh, from home. Uh, this is an introducer needle, and I'm sure the set may come. Yeah. But in any case, uh, the introducer needle is a surrogate. It's a 22 gauge uh, uh, introducer needle. So this 22 gauge is, is probably better visualized than uh, 25. So you could imagine I'm using this like a dart, OK? So I'm going to aim for the interlamellar space. And as I introduce this towards the interlamellar space, then after that, it is through this I will introduce the 25. So you may not see the 25 gauge needle as it goes through, but you will see some tissue, tissue movements. And eventually, the, the final litmus test is to see the CSF efflux. So this set comes with one. So I would put it here. Can I have some saline here, please? Uh, Rani, could you put this, uh, this over here? So, Dr. Karmaka, any time you are using uh, spinal the anesthesia the ultrasound the guided, I understand you are always using uh, an introducer needle? Or do you also yes. give spinal uh, ultrasound guided without an introducer needle? Uh, I think it is desirable to use an introducer needle because otherwise you st it's impossible to see uh, very fine needles. Okay. So there is a tendency to use larger needles, uh, like 22 gauge sometimes, which is sometimes justified in elderly people when you uh, have difficulty. But I think the first effort, effort or attempt should be with a 25 gauge spinal needle. If you have difficulty either accessing or getting CSF or, if, uh, or, or accessing the space, then I would switch to a 22 gauge. But first efforts will be with uh, 25 with an introducer needle. Now, okay. having said that, and I will show you that the introducer needle is very important because uh, this introducer needle actually shows you the path of the needle following, and this is the path through which the spinal needle will be introduced. So there are efforts uh, in, uh, in many quarters, like uh, we are working with some companies to try and develop echogenic introducer needle. You can't produce echogenic spinal needles because it has to go through some rigorous testing about uh, dural injuries and postdural puncture, that sort of thing. The simplest thing would be to introduce, produce an introducer which is longer, but it has the echogenic edges in, in them, like your tap needles or other needles that are available. And you introduce this to the, uh, close to the interlamellar space so that the eventual distance from there to the spinal canal or the thickal sac is, is, is reduced. But nevertheless, this is quite, quite adequate. Which is the lig lignocaine for infiltration, please? So I have a little pot here, you can see. Uh, this uh, galley pot has some normal saline, and I'm going to use this normal saline as the, as the coupling agent here, uh, and I will perform the uh, intervention with this. So you must be <coughs> quite generous with your saline. And notice that when I, when I apply it, I do not put this gauze back here, because it's possible to take skin contaminants and put it into this again. And if you are going to use loss of resistance, say if you're doing an epidural, you may take this saline and you may put skin commensal organisms into the epidural space. So this is an important and very important step where I said, I'm going to take this, I'm going to apply some saline and be liberal and put it on the back. And, okay. and I'm going to put it into the bin, okay? Now, as you will see here, I put the marks here, so I don't need to do the routine again. So I'm going to place my transducer relative to this mark. So as you will see here, oh. Can you press this freeze button? Dr. Marker, there is a question uh, yeah, okay. regarding the length of the introducer needle. People are asking, can they have a longer introducer needle so that the distance bit from the needle tip, that's the introducer needle, to the dura is reduced? Here is the standard introducer needle that comes with the kit. Uh, and I think he game. just answered that question for you, that uh, they are trying to develop longer echogenic introducer needles. Is that right, uh, okay. Dr. Karmakar? Okay. Uh, well, just a moment. I will answer that question, but we have a little technical problem here. Because of the sleeve, you can see that it is attenuating the signal quite significantly. So I may have to modify this a little bit. I have already put the tachyderm, so I may cut this outer sleeve off, okay? 
Can I have a scissor, please? Uh, so you can see that uh, it is attenuating the signal quite significantly, right? So it is not really appropriate because I have a, actually this cover is outside the tegaderm, so there are two layers and I think this is uh, causing this. So if I remove this, you will see the attenuation. I just need something sterile. Okay, so I have uh, removed that, and hopefully, I'll be careful. Yeah, I'll put another one here. Good. Thank you. Okay, let's see now what happens. I'm going to put this saline again, and uh, I'm going to do a paramedian sagittal scan. Yeah, so the, now you see the gain is too much. Okay, let's reduce the gain, please, for Shelley. Okay, we are in business. Okay, so uh, I've got the transducer between these two lines. So you can see here the L4-5 space is quite easily visualized. And I'd like you to also notice that how I have, I'm holding the probe. Uh, you will soon find when you do this procedure, your hands will start to hurt, ache, because you are not using, uh, you, you don't, you're going to use muscles you probably haven't used before. So you can see my three fingers. Uh, you can see the fingers, how I have attached this. Maybe you can put this on the picture, please. Switch. Ah, good. So you can see here my fingers are on top. If you zoom out a little bit. Zoom out. Yeah. So you can see here my fingers are on the back. And this is kind of anchoring onto the patient. So I'm, I'm anchoring onto the back. And I use my other two fingers to just hold the probe. I also have my shoulder here. If you play golf, you'll understand this. You have to be connected. That means if you, if you have your body onto your, uh, your arms, your axilla on your, on your chest, then you are kind of fixed. You're not going to move. So this is uh, the second important thing. So I have it anchored. I have it in the right position. And now you can see the interlamellar space very clearly, right? Okay, so I'm going to now infiltrate local anesthetic. This is... Uh, is it 1%? Okay, this is, uh, I'm told, this is 2% lidocaine. And we just use it for skin infiltration. Now, in Kopatana, uh, that we're going to do a... Okay, good, thank you. So, uh, I'm going to infiltrate uh, on the right, on the non-dependent side, obviously. But when you infiltrate, just don't do it blindly because this is a very important opportune moment when you can use this to determine the angle of insertion. Okay, like you see here, actually I, I, can, I can infiltrate and I can see some, some evidence of where my needle is heading. Okay, so as you will see here, okay, I just infiltrate the skin here. Oh, this is very fine needle. Uh, no, no, it's okay. That's perfect. Uh, just be careful of this, okay? Now, I'm going to take the introducer. Let me apply a little bit more saline before I do that. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to use the introducer needle. And I know where it is, okay? So this is the space that we are looking for. You see there? Okay. Uh, there's some contact artifact. I can't really help much about that. So I'm going to put the needle relative to this. And as you see here, I'm going to try and see and bring this needle into plane, okay? Uh, because of the contact artifact, I can't really show you the... Okay, the needle is coming from here. So uh, my advice to you is, uh, before you insert the needle, I'm, I'm trying to look under the skin. Can you see there? I'm trying to visualize the needle very close to the skin first. 
And after that, I will, I will try and aim for the target that I want. So, uh, you see, I'm jiggling it. I'm trying to find the opt op optimal angle that I need to insert the needle. Can you, uh, you can see some tissue movement there. And I'm trying to go towards the interlamellar space. I think you can see now my needle is very close to the ligament of flavor. That's the tip of the needle, okay? Yes, I'm we can appreciate that. Almost the entire length of it. Okay, now this is, this is uh, pretty much what, what you need to do. Uh, this would apply for uh, epidurals too. Uh, because epidural needles are larger needles, it's much easier to see it. So uh, when you put a tuhi needle and you put it uh, like so, I would just guide it to this position and then you just put the transducer down and use your loss of resistance as you would normally do. Okay, can I have the spinal needle now? I will try to show you what, what it looks like, but as you can see, uh, it's, it's just outside the door. So I'm going to take this 25 gauge needle and introduce it gently. And you can see now the needle is, is emerging through that yeah. uh, to the spinal introducer and hopefully I, I, I insert it into the spinal canal. Uh, I have felt the click and I will remove the stylet now. Now remember don't expect CSF to come out gushing because if you look at uh, Rochelle, can you show the point the marker on the scale on the right? If you uh, put it up where the dura is. If you see the, the position of the, the dura relative to the scale on your right, put, go to the right. Okay, you see that the dura is about four centimeters from the skin. So there is uh, a certain amount of hydrostatic pressure has to be overcome. As you can see here, uh, you can see here. Yeah, yeah, focus, Karna. You help me? Needle me. Ah. You can see here there is a, a CSF is, is, is effluxing, but it is, it is effluxing very slowly. Can you see that? This is because of the physical principle that your needle is approaching in the paramedian axis and it's coming at a height. So don't expect CSF to come out very, uh, very rapidly, in, particularly in elderly patient, because in the lateral position, your CSF pressures can be relatively low. Okay, so would you like to do the injection for me? So you can see now the CSF has just emerged and it's nearly taken a minute, as you can see here. So we have to be very patient when you do uh, spinal injections with this. So the question is, uh, should you be doing uh, paramedian spinals uh, through the non-dependent side? Uh, and why do you do, how, how do you do paramedian? These are questions that uh, have, have arisen and are, are, are being addressed. Yeah, sure. Are you aspirating, Deepak? Yeah, there should be. Yeah, good. So we can aspirate. It's a 25 needle, so you often have difficulty. Now, uh, as I said, so maybe the non-dependent side may be preferable. So this is a, a resident pro uh, a research project that is, under, uh, is being uh, undertaken in our department. But, uh, but the problem is, uh, if I just show you here, if you, if you put it on the non-dependent side, like so, I find it ergonomically quite quite complex to perform the intervention, but it is possible as you can see here. And there may be some good reason why we should go from the non-dependent side. Okay, the final thing I, I want to show you is while the spinal is taking effect and I don't delay the, the thing is, I want to show you the L5-S1 gap because this is something that uh, we've been talking about. So this is the L4, L5 through which we did the intervention. Uh, some more saline, please, here. What is that fluid? Yeah, I, I won't. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of saline to saline. just show saline. them the L5 is one gap. So I have a question for you. Would you not use this sterile, uh, sterile gel that comes with the set? No. Okay. The gel is uh, uh, no, no. The gel, the material or the content of the gel is, is not, uh, uh, you know, friendly with the the meninges and the structures that lie underneath. So, 
it, uh, it will induce chemical reactions and uh, possibly arachnoiditis and meningitis. So, okay, you can see here that in this lady there is, uh, we see the L5, L4, L5, uh, and as you go further distally, we can see the sacrum, which is here, and if you go further up, we should see the L5S1 gap, which is probably this, this area here. So, uh, I don't want to delay it because you've got to do the other way. Yeah, it's a, it's a heavy solution. So, so we're going to turn the patient over and we would do it. This uh, lady is going to, is, has a CA bladder and it is on the lateral wall. And uh, we are going to be showing you an obturator nerve block in her. And Dr. Amjad Manyar would be uh, the faculty who would be performing the block for you. So I'll have uh, Dr. Amjad uh, talk to you while Deepak preps the case. I can Hello. be the technician. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, I have a screen for her. Yeah, am I am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Oh. All right. So you've seen a very nice demonstration of a spinal by Dr. Kamakar, but for this particular patient who is undergoing a bladder tumor resection, it may not be a complete anesthetic. The reason is they are uh, she's got a tumor on the lateral wall of the bladder, and this lies in close proximity to the obturator nerve. Now the resection is being done by electric currents and there's always a possibility that the obturator nerve may be stimulated. This can lead to a phenomenon known as the obturator kick and the patient could have a violent spasm of the adductor muscles during resection. This could lead to perforation of the bladder. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to give an obturator nerve block to ensure that this does not happen. Uh, now, Dr. Amjad, are you proceeding with the obturator uh, nerve block without uh, checking the level of spinal uh, anesthesia? Uh, Dr. Amjad, are you with us? us out with that. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rani here will check. It's a T10, is it? Yeah, it's already been checked apparently. It's T10 right now. So uh, are you going to uh, do an obturator nerve block from the point of uh, view of demonstration? Or if you have a T10 level, you, st you will still do an obturator block for a TURBT? I will still do the obturator block because what we're dealing with is a local stimulation. We're not, the, the spinal might be working and it might be very high also, but what the surgeon might wind up doing is doing a local stimulation of the nerve. And this will cause contractions, regardless of whether you're given a spinal. The only other alternative is to give a general anesthetic with a muzzle relaxant to prevent this phenomenon. That's right. Okay. Can you have the legs? So you can see that the patient is in supine position. I'm going to ask someone to slightly abduct the leg. And the most important thing you actually do before you have this block done is to ensure you're blocking the correct side. You need to go through the ultrasound report and ensure which side the tumor is. In this particular lady, the tumor is on the right side. I've looked at the ultrasound scan myself. You can also confirm it with the surgeon that it is on the patient's right side. Uh, can we get this off? Yeah. And it looks to be straightened out. Just, just slightly. Probably got, yeah. All right, we'll just. <coughs> yeah. Can I get the can I get a whole towel? Can I get a whole towel place to So we're going to be using a high frequency probe and we're going to try to look for the obturator now. We just, just put it around here, the whole okay. You can just put now the obturator nerve is a branch of the lumbar plexus. It courses down beside the psoas muscle, enters the obturator canal, and once it's there, there's a division of the nerve that occurs. It divides into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. The anterior branch mainly supplies the adductor longus and the adductor brevis and the pectineus muscles, and the posterior branch will supply 
a bit of the brevis muscle occasionally, and mostly the adductor magnus muscle. So we require to block both these branches of the nerve to ensure that we achieve some level of safety for the patient and the surgeon. Just prepping up and uh, can you get a bit of jelly on that? Before I put it in? Dr. Amjad, uh, can you please demonstrate yes. the placement of uh, the machine, the patient and yourself, the ergonomics? Yeah, the ergonomics are such that I always, yeah, just, can you, just one moment please, let me ensure this is done, yeah, just dump it inside. Yeah. Okay, somebody just grab that end and pull it down. Yeah, just grab the, the sleeve and just pull it out. Yeah, so the patient is placed in supine position and this is a sort of ergonomic pattern that I always follow for all blocks. I like to have the machine in front of me and uh, the, the following sequence is what I like. I like to have the needle first, then comes the probe, and then comes the machine. This allows me to have good control of the needle when I'm doing this sort of a block. Okay. Okay, so we have a block needle there. All right. Yeah. So right, so you see the orientation marker? It's towards the right side of the patient and towards me. All right, so what we'll do is we'll start with more familiar locations. Okay, so what you see here is the femoral artery, the femoral vein, the femoral nerve. Okay, Are, is everybody familiar with this location? I think when you're talking there, you consider that the audience would like to know from A to Z. So that will be better if you go on telling them as to what you're dealing with. All right. Uh, could somebody point out the femoral nerve? I'm going to point out the femoral nerve at first, okay? Medial to that is the artery, you can see the arterial pulsations. This is the general location where you would do a femoral nerve block. And you have the vein, a compressible structure, okay? So I'm going to leave this familiar area and trace my probe a little bit more medially. Okay? And now I see a fairly large and well-defined muzzle here. Okay, this is the pectineus. All right, so I'm going to go further more medially. And I'm going to look, I'm just going to angulate my probe a bit. And look for three layers of muzzles. The first one on top is the adductor longus. The second layer is the adductor magnus. And below that, lie, sorry, the second layer is the adductor brevis, and the third one is the adductor magnus, which you see, they're fairly large and deep muzzle. Now, the anterior branch of the obturator nerve lies between the adductor longus and the adductor brevis muzzle. The posterior branch lies between the adductor brevis and the adductor magnus muzzle. Now, you don't always see a nerve because the nerve is extremely flat. It's one of the flattest nerves you'll get. So it doesn't matter if you don't see it very well, what we can try to do is just dissect open those planes and that should be good enough to have the block done. You just try to scan around and see if we can get it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see the needle pointer with a flattened hyperechoic structure there. There's possibly the posterior branch of the obturator nerve there. And right up there, you can see between the longus and the brevis, just at that junction, you see a hyperechoic yeah, to the left. Okay, so we, we'll do the anterior branch first. We'll just split open the layer. Can I get the needle? Okay, 
Okay, all right. So we're just going to get started with this block here. What we have here is an eight centimeter echogenic needle, and I'm going to be going in plane. Okay, so you see the needle coming there. I'm just targeting this hyperechoic structure over there. Aspirating. Okay, I'm just going to split that layer open. So this is between the adductor longus and the adductor brevis. Once injected, you do see a bit of hyperechoic structure. A really tiny little thing there, it's possible that would be the nerve. All right, just about five or eight mils of local anesthetic over there. Then we're going to look to target posterior branch. of depth on that, please. Yeah, that looks a lot like it. So I'm going to target that structure where the needle is. Just having a look at my location. So you can see how the hyperechoic needle lights up, the echogenic needle. I'm just going to go there. Do you see the hyperechoic structure right over there? Anesthetic around the nerve. I'm just going to go on to the other side. Okay, so I just got a message that I need to hurry up with this block. I'm just going to deposit the local anesthetic around there, and we're kind of done. How much solution are you infiltrating there? Yeah, I've injected for the posterior branch about 6 ml so far, and I think that should be good enough. I okay. used about 6, 7 ml for the anterior branch and the same for the posterior branch. And that is the obturator nerve block. Dr. Amjad, can you once again show the probe position and the direction of the needle? Audience will like to go through it again. Okay. Just quickly, you can demonstrate to them. Just yeah. So you, you see me standing right here. All right. Probe follows me, and you have the machine there. So the sequence is the needle comes first, and I hold this concept for every block that I do. Needle first, probe second, machine third. Okay. The needle entry is lateral to medial, similar to what you would do for a femoral nerve block. It's the same ergonomics as the femoral nerve block, just that the block is done a lot more medial, where the adductor muscles are. Uh, Dr. Kakar, can I interrupt you here? Yes, please. So we, we are ready in the other theater. Uh, with the uh, upper limb blocks and uh, we have Dr. Sandeep Devan there all ready for you. He would show you an infraclavicular block and we could have the discussion over tea time or lunch okay, when Dr. Uh, Maniar would be there. 
Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now, Dr. Kakar? Yes, we can hear it. Yes, we can. Okay, so we are in the other OR, and we have Dr. Sandeep Devan already. Sandeep, all yours. Yeah. Morning, everybody. Good morning, Dr. Sandeep. Good morning, Dr. Sandeep. Yeah, we are, we'll be demonstrating the intraclavicular block. So I have just, uh, just tried to point out the anatomical landmarks. Can you see this? Yes. This is the interscalene groove which has been marked. This is the clavicle. We are going below the clavicle. I think you'll have to take the, from this side. It's just getting the things in the right place, the camera in the right place. Okay. So this is the clavicle. This is the coracoid process. And this is the anatomical landmark for the intraclavicular block, which is around 1.5 to 2 centimeters medial and inferior to the coracoid process. So the brachial plexus, which starts from the roots, then the trunks, and the divisions in the supraclavicular area, it passes through this line. If you join the C6 tubercle, the midpoint of the clavicle, and the axillary artery, they form what is called as the brachial line. So anything along this, you can place your needles for the interscalene, for the supraclavicular, the intraclavicular, and the axillary. Uh, this is a one which we are showing, going to show with the neurostimulation. So this is the needle which we use. This is a 50 mm stimulating needle, where the tip is uncovered with the sheath, while the rest is all covered with the uh, insulating sheath. Just if you can tell them the position of the arm before you proceed. Yeah, that's what we are coming to. Now, the patient is supine with the head turned to the, towards the opposite side, and the arm, the forearm always lies on the abdomen. The forearm always lies on the abdomen in this particular block. So you need not go for the external rotation and abduction, what you do in axillary. Now, when you insert your needle at this point, it goes through two uh, muscles, that is the pec major and the pec minor. You always see for two pops, when you enter into the, uh, just beyond, beyond the pectoralis minor fascia, where you come across the uh, lateral cord. So you ignore the contractions of the lateral cord and try to pinpoint uh, at the, uh, the posterior cord or the medial cord. So I'll just infiltrate at this point. You'll have to just hold him, he's very anxious. There is a reason. So the needle enters at this point and it goes vertically through the two fascias. Yeah. Then we switch on our PNS. This is a stimiplex HNS12. We try to elicit some of these contractions. These are actually the shoulder contractions, which need to be ignored. Oh, that's because of the uh, the, uh, the neurostimulation of the direct stimulation of this. Now we are getting the, the contractions of the deltoid, so we are very close to the axillary nerve. Can we just make it 
play not by chance this single pitch Yeah, we start with usually 1 milliampere or maybe 1.5 milliampere and then we go ahead with the and now you can, uh, yeah. focus on the wrist and the hand. Uh, this is actually the lateral cord stimulation that is the muscular cutaneous. Can you ask him to spread the fingers? Can you just hold his hand like this? <laughs> now this is 1.6 actually. So you are getting both the lateral cord as, as well as the medial cord and now as you go still further you are now getting the medial cord stimulation. You can get the flexion of the wrist as well as the flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints. Okay. When, when you move your needle a bit more uh, cephalad you are getting the lateral cord stimulation and So as you progress your needle towards the, uh, the, 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 the medial cord now, you will see there is more flexion of the medial cord, the reflection of the, the flexion of the metacarpophalangeal and the, the wrist joint. You can cut down the current now. No one has to hold the hand. No one has to hold the hand. Yeah. Ask somebody to always hold the hand so that it gets more stabilized and as it goes still further you will find that there is only flexion now you have to ignore all the contractions of the of the lateral cord which causes